glad you're now quarantined. So all the guys that work for me, they have to be there every day. So I, I've been going four days a week. And it's hard to keep up with what they're doing if I'm at home. So sure. i got to go to at least something to see what they're doing and what they might be.
I'm sorry I couldn't help you. I don't really know that song very good. But uh, good to see you folks back tonight. Uh, we will be in uh, Luke 16. Kind of a review, but kind of some things that we didn't touch on this morning. And we, we're actually going to make it through verse 13 tonight, I think. And uh, But good to see you folks, so let's pray. Uh, Father God, we're thankful for who you are, what you've done, uh, sending your Son on the cross to die for us, uh, his blood washing away our sins. We're thankful for that. We're thankful for each new year that you give us, the, the blessings, uh, unspeakable, Lord. Uh, we don't even understand uh, uh, what you give to us and how you help us every day. And, and Lord, as we look at uh, your son's teachings again tonight, just give us open hearts and open eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, let's try again. I think this one will be more well-known. 603. first day thank you that we could all be here today and worship you please help us to have a great rest of the day in your name amen
54. politicians were on a plane, a senator, a representative, and a bureaucrat. And the senator looked at them all and said, I could throw one $10,000 bill off that window and make someone really happy. The representative said, well, I could throw 10 $1,000 bills out that window and make 10 people happy. The bureaucrat said, I have you both beat. I could throw 100 $100 bills out the window and make a hundred people happy. A reporter finally spoke up and said, I could throw all three of you out the window and make the entire country happy. And the local, the local United Way office, you didn't laugh that hard at my funny joke this morning. I didn't laugh, that was our good. I know. You didn't laugh this morning either. The local United Way office uh, was looking through records and realized that the town's most successful businessmen hadn't contributed anything uh, to their cause. He called up the, the a volunteer called up the businessman and said, "Our research shows that out of a yearly income of more than six hundred thousand, you have not given one penny to charity." Would you like to give back to the community in some way? There was silence on the phone for a moment until finally the businessman replied, First, did your research show that my mother is dying after a long illness with lots of medical bills, several times her annual income? Embarrassed, the United Way volunteer rep mumbled, um, no. Second, that my brother, a disabled vet, is blind and confined to a wheelchair. The United Way rep began to stammer out an apology, but was cut off. My sister's husband died in a tragic accident, leaving her penniless with three children. The humiliated United Way officer, completely beaten, simply said, I had no idea. On a roll, the businessman cut him off once again, and I don't give any money to them, so why should I give any money to you? We spend a lot of time talking about money. There's lots of jokes about money. Probably this year especially, you've talked a lot about money with the stimulus checks and with the unemployment, and uh, you've probably even had discussions about money that sort of escalated into a, uh, an argument or a fight. And uh, because money is one of those topics that just causes a lot of issues, but money is also one of those topics that is a spiritual subject. And the Bible talks about money uh, a lot. In fact, a lot more than a lot of other subjects. The Bible has over 2,000 verses that speak about money. How, how many of the parables that Jesus told were about money? I said it this morning at least twice. A third, thank you, a third. So Jesus talks a lot about money, he talks a lot about our possessions, 
what we need to do with them, how we need to uh, deal with them and whatnot. So the Bible has so many verses on money because God knows money is a huge aspect of our lives. It, it dominates our lives. And one thing about God is those things that are important in our lives, he wants to have a say. So Luke chapter 16 is one of those places where God is giving us directions about money. He is giving us a say. So start in verse 1. Uh, Luke's, or he also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward, and an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods. So he called him out and said, what is this I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said within himself, what shall I do? For my master is taking this stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I am ashamed to beg. I have resolved what to do, that when I am put out of the stewardship, that I may be received into their houses. So he called every one of his master's debtors to him, and excuse me, said to the first, How much do you owe my master? And he said, A hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, Take your bill, sit down quickly, and write fifty. Then he said to another, How much do you owe? So he said, A hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, Take your bill, write eighty. So the master can commending the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. Are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you or trust true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal. Not serve God and mammon. So there's characters in this story. Uh, anybody want to take a guess? Who's the one of the main characters in the story? The rich man. Yes, the rich man. He's a very wealthy landowner. You can tell by these very large amounts that he is owed. So he is a big time businessman. Who who are the other two people in the story? The steward, uh, he was the uh, unjust steward, or the prodigal steward. Uh, he's a sinful steward, let's put it that way. Uh, he was wasteful, he was totally irresponsible, he was careless with money. He was throwing it away, I don't know if he was buying just stupid things, but the tense of the verb in the Greek is that he was continuously wasting. This wasn't just a, a one-time event, he's been squandering and wasting things for years and years and years. So who's the, the third person in the story? This is a little bit tougher. You did The debtors, yeah, I guess we could say that. I was thinking this, the accuser. Did you guys notice that? There was a person at there at the very beginning that reported the mismanagement to the wealthy owner. Now it's very interesting that verse there uh, the Greek word, when it says an accusation was brought, that Greek word is diabolos. Who else is called diabolos in the Bible? Huh? Satan. So diabolos in Greek actually means accuser. That's one of the names of Satan. And that's one of the things that Satan constantly does in the life of a believer. He, he accuses us uh, of things before God. He, he goes up uh, to God and he can, whenever we make a mistake or sin or whatever, he's pointing it out. Now look at the reaction of the landowner. He begins to act immediately. We went over that this morning and he calls the steward in. What is this I hear? Give me your accounting books. You're fired. I mean, the steward had one job manage the property or some aspect of this uh, wealthy man's company and he, he can't do it. He 
you got to go. Boom. Verse 3. Reality sets in for the steward. What am I going to do? I mean, this is much more serious than just unemployment, right? It's not like you can get unemployment checks. It's not like there's stimulus packages back then. What else did that imply? What, what is another reason? He's not just losing his job. What's another reason why he is so worried about, about this situation he's in? Anybody remember? Pardon me? Yeah, he doesn't. Yeah, he doesn't want to work. He's a he's a white collar guy, right? He does not. He's not a blue collar guy. He went to college for managing, and that's all he's going to do. What else? He's lazy. Yeah. What else? What was another problem about losing his job? Pardon me. Nobody would want to hire. Nobody would want to rehire him. Yeah. What else? Anything else? He had no place to go, yeah. Remember that? We talked about this morning. Um, if he would be fired as manager of the property, he probably lived on site. So not only is he losing his job, he's losing his house. Where is he going to live? Where is his kids going to live? And he doesn't know what he's going to do. So the light comes on in verse 4. I know what I'll do. And uh, he, he decides that He's going to kind of get this little trickery and get a bunch of favors. Has anyone here ever looked at the newspaper want ads? Um, have you ever seen the want ad that, that says something and it says this phrase, must have own transportation? You ever seen that? I've seen that a lot, must have own transportation. Um, what that tells me, that type of job, is getting there is more, takes more brain power than doing the job. It's like, it always says that on concrete finishers, must have own transportation. It's harder to get there than it is to rake concrete, okay? It's hard work, hard work digging and shoveling, but it doesn't take a lot of brain power, okay? Um, this guy, that's the way he was thinking. I don't want to do one of those menial, menial type of jobs. He doesn't want to do outdoor labor. He's not going to beg, so he develops this ingenious scheme. Verse 5, he calls every one of the wealthy man's debtors. Now, I think I mentioned this morning that the two that are listed are just examples. Okay, When he says every one of his debtors, there was a lot more than two. This is just an example, Jesus wasn't going to go through every single one. And he, he really starts really kind of cooking the books in a way, altering the books and uh, large amounts, in some cases up to half. A hundred measures of oil uh, reduced to half. Uh, today, olive oil is about $20 a gallon. So writing off 437 gallons of olive oil, that'd be like $9,000 in today's money. So back then, a, a huge number. We, let's, let's knock off 20%. Now, not surprisingly, what did every one of these debtors agree to do? Yeah, I'll take that deal, right? They all take the deal, and they want to pay less. Now, an important note, I don't know if I mentioned this, uh, the reason why he he cooked the books like this was the culture of the day. Back then, if you did somebody a favor, they were obligated to do you a favor. Now, if he just did it with one or two, it wouldn't be a big deal. But he did it with a lot of different people. So there's like peer pressure. Well, he took care of me, and he, I, I got to take care of him. And everybody would kind of uh, go in and, and start uh, helping him. And he knew soon he would have no food, no job, no home, no nothing. So he's going to gain all these favors from all these different people. He's basically uh, setting up a retirement account plan. Kind of a shady thing, but um, he does it. I think I'm, I mentioned this really quickly. Uh, Helen has been going back and forth uh, with this guy. And they're always like, let's make the decision now. Let's do it now. I mean, this is the way this guy's talking, so we know it's a shady deal. We know that it's kind of a, a crooked, uh, a shyster-type operation. If anyone ever wants you to make a decision quickly, right now, they don't want to give you time to think, 
Chances are it's a shady deal. Could even be fraud. I, I remember my grandpa used to tell me if an offer sounds too good to be true, what is it? Probably is. It probably is, right? Right? So uh, these this they, but these guys they, they sit down quickly, they sign sign the papers. Come on, man, sign it right now, come on. This is the deal of a lifetime. And they they do. You know, if you, you ever get somebody that does that, um, say, hey, I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to take the night and pray about it. I mean, a lot of big decisions, uh, realtors and different things. Andrea and I told the realtor, we're going to take the night off and we're going to pray about it. We're going to think about it. Might save yourself a ton of hassle. Uh, little did these debtors know that the steward was losing his job and that they, this was all a con really on them, so they would be obligated to house and feed him for the rest of his life. Do this quickly, quickly, right? Verse saying, This is incredible. When the master, the rich landowner, finally gets the books, I, I, this morning I mentioned an hour, I don't know if it was an hour, two hours, uh, an afternoon, whatever it was, a day. Uh, <clears throat> one commentator said, when he fired the steward, he should have immediately escorted him off the property right then. <laughs> that happens today sometimes. My dad worked at the same concrete plant for 12 years. They came in and said, you're done. And the guy stood there, gather all your stuff, walked him out to his car. That happens. That's, that's probably what they should have done with this guy. But the landowner starts to kind of, wow, you got me. You were one shrewd player. I never saw this coming. He says, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with your resourcefulness. I'm impressed with your ingenuity. He knows that uh, he was gaining these favors from all these people that he's going to be taking care of the rest of his life. You know, I'm sure he could have had the steward jailed or beaten or something, but he was so floored. They say, like, wow, bravo. <laughs> See you later. Some of the commentators suggest that the amount that was written off was the interest. And in ancient Israel in those days, it was against the law to charge usury, to charge interest. And um, it was kind of a backdoor shady deal for him to charge interest. So by this guy writing it off, the landowner couldn't attack him because... He couldn't admit that he was even charging interest in the first place. Just a thought. I don't know if that's what's going on or not. Verse 9. This is where we get to the application now that we've reviewed what's going on. Uh, Jesus stops the story and he tells us uh, the application. And there's three lessons. Number one. Prepare for the future. Class somebody... What is every person's future? What's every person's future? Gonna die, right? No one uh, gets out of this world alive. The statistics are staggering. 100%, right? Incredible odds. No one makes it out of this world alive. Uh, true born again believers one day will meet God face to face. And Jesus Christ tells us to prepare for that day. We read uh, Matthew 6, 19 and 20 this morning. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust destroy and where thieves can break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where none of that stuff can happen. You know, businesses, they go crazy planning for their future. They try every conceivable scheme to give themselves an advantage to make their lives comfortable here on earth. You know, how much more should Christians be using their money to invest in the future? When how long does heaven last? Forever. Right, forever. Now don't get me wrong, Jesus is not teaching that it is possible to buy our way into heaven. There's a few people that have read this passage and, and come to that conclusion. What he is saying is that we are to make friends who will welcome you into heaven someday. 
And this can be done with money. This can be done uh, with giving. Give to the church. Give to missions. Give to the gospel uh, preaching ministry. Give to further the kingdom of God. And then one day you might meet somebody that is saved because of that dollar that you give. Very fascinating uh, passage. When you give to God, you are directly involved in contributing to people's salvation. Question. When you get to heaven, will you have a welcoming committee? Something to think about. Are you contributing uh, to the gospel ministry? Jesus says, use unrighteous mammon, uh, worldly things that, can, that will be wear, worn out and potentially worthless someday. Use that to further God's kingdom by investing in your future. And Jesus implied some of these yields uh, we will not see until we get to heaven. But how amazing would that be to be welcomed into heaven by people who came to know Christ partially because of your gift. Number one, prepare for the future. Number two, verses 10 through 12, be faithful. Now notice this incredible and obvious truth. Circumstances do not determine faithfulness. See that in this, with those verses? You know, if you take care of business when you do not have much to do, you're going to take care of business when you have a lot to do. That's what Jesus is saying. And God's not going to accept excuses in this area. Some people say, well, you know, if I had more money, if God gave me more money, then I'd give more. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. And this isn't me saying this. Jesus says it right here. The words are in red if you have that style Bible. If you had more, you still wouldn't give it. Because circumstances don't determine your faithfulness. You have to have decided in your heart that you will be faithful with whatever you have, even if it's just a little bit. So the application question to consider is, uh, who are you right now? Are you that faithful one or are you the unfaithful one? Well, Pastor Josh, you know, um, I'm young, but when I get a job, then, then, I'm going to, then I'm going to do that. Then I'm going to give. Then I'm going to tithe. You know, when I settle all my debts, when I take care of all my expenses, then I'm going to give something to God. What about God, what he's given us right now? Jesus says, if you're faithful in little, you will be faithful with much. Of course, there's the flip side to that. If you are unjust, what does that mean there? What does unjust mean? If you are unjust, what does that mean? <coughs> Any ideas? If you are unjust with little, you will be unjust with much. What's that talking about? Unjust. Everybody's not, scared. Not huh? Good. Not good? Not good. <laughs> right, not good. If you're sinful. <coughs> if you are, are not doing well with uh, a little, you're not going to do well with much. You know, you might be materialistic or selfish or irresponsible or careless, careless or wasteful. It's not like all of a sudden you have a bunch of stuff and you're going to come to your senses and then I'm going to do everything right. <laughs> Verse 11 makes it very clear that if we're not faithful with money here on earth, investing in God's kingdom, what won't we get in heaven? Verse 11. I'm looking at it again to make sure the question makes sense. Rewards. Why would God give us extra stuff up there if we didn't give him anything here? You know? Verse 12. The way we use our money here on earth has eternal consequences. You know, if, if you don't get anything else out of this tonight, think about that. The way we use our money here on earth has eternal consequences. 
prepare for the future and be faithful. Number three, the third lesson application from this is you cannot serve two masters. Now this is one of those things that we say it, but maybe we don't quite think about it, but it is, it's common sense. You can't be a slave to two people at one time. I mean, put yourself back in that culture. They, they sold people as property. You could be bought and sold. Uh, slaves were owned. You can only be owned by one person at a time. Nowadays, no one owns us. You can have multiple jobs. You can work for this guy, you have a shift. You can work for this person, you have a shift. Uh, but back then, if you were a slave, you were owned. One master. You know, two people couldn't own you and, and tell you what to do. You'd be split in half. It wouldn't work. Now, to kind of put this in a spiritual uh, context as well, when we accept Christ, whose slave do we become? God's. We are God's slave. Repeatedly, all over, the Word of God tells us that when you accept Christ, you become God's slave. The Greek word, anybody want to take a guess? Doulos. Slave. Doulos. God's word says, 1 Corinthians 7, 23, he says, you were bought with a price. We're owned by God. You know, at the end of our lives, we strive to hear from God, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Yes, in the Greek, guess what it is? Doulos. Slave. Well done, thou good and faithful slave. A lot of times in our English translation, it, it softens it a little bit. It says servant, but really it's, it's slave. Sometimes we have a difficult time understanding this concept about slavery because we haven't had it here in our country in, in 150 years. But the Greeks knew what slaves were. The Romans knew. The Jewish people knew. It all made sense because they knew slaves. They knew slaves had no rights. Slaves had no freedoms. Slaves couldn't go anywhere without permission. Slaves couldn't join the army. Slaves couldn't go to court. There was no laws protecting slaves. You were, you were property. A slave couldn't own any property. They had no citizenships. If a, slave, if a slave had hopes and dreams, like every person, they have hopes and dreams, they have aspirations, a slave couldn't do that. Slaves were totally dependent on their owners. Unlike servants, servants were employees who could quit. Slaves didn't have that option. And repeatedly, all over the New Testament, God calls us slaves. We are owned by Him. Galatians 1.10 says, For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a slave of Christ. So this means we are only to please one master. I know a lot of different people, they sort of run around like a chicken with their head cut off, uh, trying to get everyone, <laughs> trying to please everything, trying to please so many people. Jesus says, no, no, we only please one master. We're, we're God's slaves, forever owned exclusively by God, completely submitted uh, and singularly obedient to him. Constantly available. I mean, this is the, 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 New, the New Testament concept of slavery. No man can be a slave to two masters. You cannot serve both God and money. It's either one or the other. You're either completely sold out to God or you're sold out to money or something else. Jesus says you cannot do both. Now, when Jesus starts preaching on money, and when pastors start preaching on money, uh, a lot of people sort of get a little bit antsy, they get a little bit upset, and people didn't like, don't like it. And, and look at verse 14. We didn't read it. 
But the Pharisees did like this. What Jesus is preaching about, what he is talking about in regards to slavery and serving God and, and all these concepts, uh, the Pharisees didn't like it. Why didn't they like what Jesus was teaching about money according to verse 14? Huh? Because they loved money. Right? They, they loved money. So they were a slave to money. So we have a choice. We, we hate God or we hate money. We hate all the things that this world has to offer and we serve love and we are loyal to the Lord. I mean, it's kind of the choice. Pick one. You can't do both. You know, um, we're about done. Um, next Sunday, <laughs> I shouldn't even tell you what I'm doing. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about money again. We're going to take a break from Luke. We're going to talk about money in the morning, and it's going to be it's going to be a fun sermon. I promise. We're going to have fun. I'm going to do this really really neat illustration. You'll you'll never forget it. Okay. The first time I saw it, I, I never forgot it. Okay. And then it's going to really bring some of this uh, home. And then then we won't talk about money for a long time again. Okay. Um, until Jesus does again. But. Uh, Prepare for your future, be faithful, and serve God. That's what Jesus is trying to teach in this parable. So any questions, comments, any, anything that you thought of either from this morning that I said that maybe didn't make sense or maybe I didn't hit on it tonight and you were hoping I, I would, anything at all? Questions, comments, disagreements. So the guy still got fired. He still got fired, right? Even though his owner said, oh, you were really shrewd. I mean, he admired him, but he still fired him. Did you hear what Marcia said? She said, did the guy still get fired? It sure seems like it. But there are some commentators that suggest that he brought him back. I don't know. It sure seems like he got fired. Anybody have any comments on that? Did the, did the unjust... Uh, wasteful steward. Did he get fired? He stayed fired? Nobody has any opinion. I think he did. Anybody else? Good question. Ben. Uh, so mammon, yes, would be anything, I think I almost said it, but I was so fast at the end there. Um, so mammon would be anything that's of this world, things that are uh, characterized as worldly things. Um, whether it be money, whether it be uh, material things, uh, things like that. I thought I had it written here, but I can't find it now. Uh, mammon would be something of this world. The third character? Mm hmm. Okay. Good call. Appreciate it. Anything else? All right. Uh, you want to sing that last song? Is there no one more? Yeah. Yeah. Then we'll go uh, <coughs> next door to the birthday anniversary fellowship.
this week and that eternity and uh, how we should spend our time and our money and uh, who we should be faithful to and the church and what we can do help us to stay focused on eternity and, and Jesus and not uh, worldly good.